Welcome into Breaking the Huddle. I'm Joel Klatt. This show, as always, is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. It is the one fans deserve. Um, we had some incredibly sad news uh, this week as uh, our sport and our industry lost uh, a titan of the sport. Uh, Mike Leach passed away this week. And Mike was an incredible man. And I just wanted to take a few moments to uh, talk about him, his legacy, and and give uh, maybe a fun story uh, from covering Mike, playing against Mike uh, throughout my career. Um, first and foremost, this this is a guy that will be linked, you know, to an offense and and a progression of football that that now you know is is every bit a part of every level of football as we can possibly imagine. Uh, it's not just that it's been a highly productive offense, but it's been an offense, the air raid, that he will be linked to as one of its creators, and and he really changed the sport. If if I think back, and and we all think back, to the really impactful moments of the last 20 or 25 years in college football, I think one of the most impactful moments is is when Mike became the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. And the reason he became the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma is because of this offense that he had built with Hal Mummy uh, all the way back at Valdosta State, and then they were eventually at Kentucky together. So to know why he got that job at Oklahoma, you have to know, like, why did he build this offense? So the genesis of this offense was one of the conversations that I loved the most um, during my time with Mike during my career. And he was very open about it. And, and it was actually uh, on a day in which, you know, we were told like, hey, coach is only going to have 15 minutes for the production meeting. And, and one of the questions that I had for him was, how did you think of it? You know, like, what was the creation story of this offense? And he ended up taking 45, 50 minutes with us, just sitting there talking about the air raid and its philosophy. And I thought it was so simple yet profound. And, and it was just one of the coolest experiences that that I can remember in my career. So Mike uh, immediately began talking about two different offenses and trying to marry the philosophies of each into one specific system. And he talked about the 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 schematics and the ability to throw the ball vertically like BYU was doing in the mid 80s with Lavelle Edwards and yet marry that to a philosophy that the triple option used, which the triple option at the time was Anybody can touch the ball and anybody can be productive based on what the defense is giving us. They weren't going to be totally reliant in that system on one player or one wide receiver or one running back. It was just whatever was there to be taken would be taken. And it didn't matter which of the guys were producing. So he wanted to build an offense with Hal Mummy that anybody could produce on the field and, and that would attack vertically, uh, in particular in the passing game, like uh, Lavelle Edwards' BYU teams. And that's how this thing was born. And then he starts having success at Kentucky. And he starts having success at Kentucky against a young defensive coordinator that was a coach at one of the best teams of the moment, which was a national championship team at Florida, and that coach was Bob Stoops. When Bob Stoops got the job at Oklahoma as the head man in 1999, he immediately hired Mike Leach. And the reason was is because he realized that going against that offense was incredibly difficult and that Mike was doing more with less than anybody else in the country. And then that moment, that changed the trajectory of college football and of that offense and of countless men's lives. Um, so that's how it all started. And then Mike becomes the head coach at Texas Tech. And the coaching tree is extensive. All the guys that that either cut their teeth under Mike or played for Mike, touched Texas Tech in some way, uh, or even Washington State. You know, there's obvious ones like Lincoln Riley. Uh, but Sonny Dykes is a guy who's in the playoff this year at TCU, cut his teeth under um, Mike Leach. Art Bryles is a guy. Cliff Kingsbury. Sonny Cumbie was a great assistant. Graham Harrell was a great assistant. Dana Holgerson is a great – I mean, the, the list goes on and on of guys that coached under Mike Leach that have now gone on and impacted the sport in a great way. Um, and every one of them will tell you 
and this would just be my my last point that one of the most special parts about Mike was his ability to not care what others thought. And and that really was his superpower. Quick story. In 2008, Texas Tech had a great wide receiver and a great team. Michael Crabtree was the reigning Blitnikoff winner, and Graham Harrell was their quarterback. That team would eventually go 11-1 and tie for the Big 12 South Championship. Really one of Mike's most successful, if not his most successful team. And during one of the practices uh, that, that year, he thought that they weren't good enough throwing go routes and it was a staple in the offense running four verticals, you know, four go routes. And so he thought, you know what, today in practice, that's all we're going to do. We're not going to practice run plays or, or any other passing concepts. We're just going to run go routes, whether it was routes on air or one-on-ones or seven-on-seven seven or even team period. That's the only route they were going to throw. That's the only play they were going to run. Well, about midway through the practice, some of the other coaches are realizing like, hey, you know, like we've got a Blitnikoff award winner out there in Michael Crabtree. He's probably run three or four miles already of just go routes. And they said, Mike, we can't do this. And Mike said, and this is how, how he lived and how he coached, why not? You see, one of the best parts about Mike Leach was that he was not a prisoner of his peers. And he would think outside of the box. So often in coaching, guys are unwilling to think outside of the box or try something different because they, they are afraid of criticism and they are afraid to, to go out on a limb. And yet he was not. And, and his answer to his coaches of why not was then followed up by, at some point this year, we're going to have to th uh, throw a go route against a coverage that we don't want to. And, and we're going to think back on this practice and think, you know what, I'm glad we did that. And sure enough, fast forward to the game that Texas Tech played against Texas, one of the most iconic games really of the last 20 years. And the most iconic play from that game is the Michael Crabtree touchdown down the right sideline. That was a go route. And it was against double coverage, bracket coverage, and they had little adjustments and they could drop out of it. And Graham Harrell and Michael Crabtree knew that they could, could, could complete the ball and, and be successful in that moment because Mike Leach was willing to think outside of the box weeks prior where he just threw go routes against every possible coverage during practice. They were comfortable. They executed. Crabtree scored a touchdown, and that play will forever live on in history as one of the great plays in college football history. Mike Leach, one of one, and he will truly, truly be missed. So we have a new Heisman winner. Caleb Williams from USC wins it. And there really wasn't a lot of doubt as to who was going to win the Heisman Trophy. There was some doubt about where everyone else would finish. It ends up uh, that Williams actually won every single region uh, in terms of voting, which is hard to do. Uh, but obviously, he had a phenomenal year. Um, so now this is the third Heisman winning quarterback that Lincoln Riley has coached. And this guy in six years has had five starting quarterbacks. He's had three of them win the Heisman and four of them go to New York as finalists. That's staggering right now. The success that every single quarterback is having under Lincoln Riley. And what I think is so fascinating, too, is that all of them have been a little bit different. You know, so like Mayfield was was different than Kyler and Kyler was different than Jalen Hurts and Jalen Hurts now different than Caleb Williams. And if you go back, you know, Baker w was a bit of a journeyman, but there was a little guns gunslinger to his game. He had good feet, not great, wasn't going to kill you with his feet. Then all of a sudden, Kyler Murray is a guy that, while he didn't have, have the same, I don't want to say ability from the pocket, it was just he was so much more willing to use his feet and create on the outside, quick as a hiccup. By the way, bummed for him that he tore his knee up last week. But, you know, you remember some of those moves and runs that he made, namely against Texas. That run down the left sideline was, you know, as 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 good of a run as I've ever seen. Then Jalen Hurts, much more of a runner. Um, and, and it was more in terms of less scrambling and more planned run. You know, this this guy was highly effective. And, and then Caleb Williams comes along. And Caleb Williams is kind of the best combination of all of those guys. 
He certainly can hurt you with his legs outside of the pocket. He's confident enough to scramble and yet not run, but keep his eyes down the field. And I think maybe his best strength is his ability to attack and throw on the run outside of the pocket. And then he still can hurt you from inside the pocket. So now all of a sudden, all of these different styles, you get, you start to think to yourself, man, is it the system? Well, no, because the system has morphed. It has changed. And that's where you've got to give a lot of credit to Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley has told me before, you know, I've asked him about like, what makes this such a good quarterback system? And he starts off by not describing anything, but he says, well, first of all, if your system is not a good quarterback system, it's if it's not a quarterback friendly system, then you need a new offense. It's such a great line, and it's profound in this day and age in which you know you need quality quarterback play in order to be successful, and this guy has clearly been able to do that across several different styles of player. And, and it's, it's his willingness to adjust his offense and not be so rigid. I actually think that's a big um, nod to his mentor, Mike Leach, who was not going to just say, this is how we have to do it every single time, but he would morph and he would move and he would evolve. And Lincoln Riley certainly has done that. And the offense has been different with every one of those players. Um, it's, it is interesting to me, by the way, that you see that Baker had three years in the system and you see what he was able to do. Kyler, one year in the system. Jalen, one year in the system. And now there's this, there's this guy that could be the best version of all of those players that now is going to have multiple seasons within the system. He had the first one as a freshman, basically half the year at Oklahoma. Now you see what he's able to do in his first full season as a starter at USC. Now he's still going to come back to school, and it begs the question, is the best yet to come from a Lincoln Riley quarterback. Yes, we've seen three guys win the Heisman Trophy and four of the five actually go to New York as finalists, but there's there's a world in which we haven't even seen the best version of what a Lincoln Riley quarterback can do, and that might be ahead of us for Caleb Williams. Staggering production from all of those guys. Williams absolutely deserved this. He was the best player in college football this year. And by the way, people saying, well, the injury against Utah and they lost that game, that might have been the best case study for why he deserved the Heisman Trophy. The stark difference between what USC was with Williams when healthy and what they weren't when he wasn't, uh, I think is is a feather in his cap and, and one of the reasons why he won this thing going away. All right, uh, when we come back, there's been some big coaching moves that we haven't really touched on. Obviously, we've talked about Deion Sanders, but we got to talk about some of the other big coaching moves Moves, namely in the Big Ten Conference. That's all coming up straight ahead. Well, you've heard me say time and time again that the head coach is the most important hire that a university can make. Uh, and we've got coaching moves going on. The latest being uh, a bit of a surprising move, although, you know, certainly understandable. Jeff Brom, after winning the Big Ten West and representing that side of the division in the Big Ten championship game, is moving on. He's headed to Louisville, where he played, and basically going home. And again, you understand that. Now, do I sense a lot of Big Ten coaches itching to get out of the Big Ten? No, it's generally the opposite because of the finances and the direction and trajectory of that conference. But you understand this, obviously, because this is obviously sentimental. <clears throat> so Brom's going to go back to Louisville, which leaves a big vacancy there uh, at Purdue at the reigning Big Ten West champions. Well, one of the teams that they were actually able to beat, and a bit of an upset, by the way, and, and probably should have been the Big Ten West champ, was Illinois. And a, and a huge reason why Illinois had the success that they were able to have this year was because of their defensive coordinator, Ryan Walters, a uh, young guy that is an absolute star in the coaching ranks. And uh, this will be his first opportunity to be a head coach. But I can tell you, I've known Ryan for a long time. I've known Ryan since he was 17 years old. Ryan Walters played with me at the University of Colorado. And when he came up, uh, I can remember him coming up as just a, a high school, you know, recruit and, and commitment. And he came up to run and work out with us in the summer. And so I, I knew this guy since he was uh, a young cat. And I can tell you, no one will work harder. Um, and, and no one has done, you know, more really over the course of the last year, maybe with, with less. 
What Brett Bielema and Ryan Walters were able to do at Illinois was pretty amazing, okay? That defense was one of the best defenses in the country. And when you play or face Illinois, what you have to get ready for, and this is what a lot of coaches around the league would would talk to me about, is they would say, what you have to understand is that Ryan's one of the best in the country at adjusting on the fly, in-game adjustments. He's not married to his Tuesday night game plan or Wednesday night game plan, but he would make in-game adjustments. They did that against Michigan, by the way. Probably should have if if won that game in the big house. Remember, there was a there was a botched call late in the game, a no call on what should have been an offensive pass interference that basically would have given Illinois the victory and the division championship. Uh, so Illinois had a great year. It wasn't just Chase Brown running the ball. It was all. It was also that defense. And Ryan's going to play an aggressive style of defense. He's going to adjust. And I think he's going to be very successful. The only thing I would say is, is this is going to be an interesting fit because Purdue has had an offensive identity under Jeff Brom. It's how they've won some of those games, in particular those upsets. And now you're going to go to a defensive-minded head coach. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that fit kind of takes place there in West Lafayette. But I'm certainly rooting for Ryan. And then the other two, I know they're, they're somewhat old news, but on this program, I haven't been able to give my thoughts on Luke Fickle with Wisconsin and Matt Rule at Nebraska. And, and here's the only thing I'll say. I'm just going to hesitate on two fronts. I said Scott Frost was going to be a home run. So Nebraska fans, the last thing you want me to say is this is going to be a great hire. Let's let it take place. I believe Matt Rule was did one of the best jobs in, in college football history when he took over the dumpster fire that was Baylor at the time that he took it over and he took them to double digit wins. Like he built something special that then Dave Aranda has been able to, to catapult into uh, what they were able to do when they won a big 12 championship uh, last year. So Matt Rule goes to Nebraska. It's certainly something that I think fits there. I think he's going to have a, a heck of an opportunity. And if he can recruit, like I know that he can, they should be much better. Luke Fickle goes to Wisconsin. And this is the one that I think is, is, is interesting because he could have waited around but took Wisconsin. Now, two things that I want to just draw your attention to. If the Big Ten does away with divisions, then Wisconsin will not have the opportunity to define itself as the class of a division like they have been able to over the course of the last five, six, seven, eight years in the Big Ten West. So his job could get much harder. Now, hold on for a second because you couple that with the man doing pull-ups up right there, and now in an expanded playoff format, can you expect if you're Wisconsin to compete for a playoff spot. You probably can. So even without the division, or let's say they do away with divisions, let's say you don't have that top end success within the conference. You could still elevate the program through playoff berths. And I think that's something that Luke Fickle is looking at. Uh, Jim Leonard will not stick around uh, as his defensive coordinator. So Jim Leonard will move on and I'm sure get swooped up by somebody very quickly because he's one of the great coaches in college football on the defensive side. So there's some thoughts on the coaching uh, carousel. When we come back, we're going to get some questions from Fansville. That's coming straight up. All right, let's close things out with a little uh, questions from Fansville, shall we? So let's get out there and answer some questions. Okay, David says, how are programs able to navigate the crowded December calendar? With bowl game practices, the portal window, recruiting, final exams, staff changes, it all feels like a big mess. Would you recommend changes to the calendar? Yes. I think this is one of the things that has been lost as we have been arguing about and, and, and the expansion of the playoff has taken too long to get to this point. Point, some things have fallen through the cracks, like addressing the calendar in college football. So, for instance, um, I actually think that the calendar needs to condense a little bit. I don't think that we should take all these weeks off through December, and I don't think that we should have early recruiting in December. I don't think the transfer portal should be open in December. I don't think that we should be having staff changes in December unless you're a team and a program that's their season is over. Okay, so what I would do is that I think every bowl game would play be played in December, um, and then I would try to be finishing the, se the season January 1st 
That's how when I would try to play the national championship game. It does a couple of things. One, it does what you're talking about. It would condense the schedule to where everything happens after that as far as staff changes and recruiting and transfer portal. And it would keep us away from not only the decision date for players to decide whether they're going to enter the NFL draft, but also the NFL playoffs, which suck the oxygen out of the room. All right, last one here before we get out of here today. Cody says, does Ohio State have a chance to beat Georgia? Okay, Cody, yes, they do have a chance to beat Georgia. Is it a matchup that if I was Georgia, I would be thinking to myself, man, this is what we get for the number one seed? Yeah, of all the possible matchups, I think this is the one that gives Georgia the most problems, namely because the one thing that Georgia not struggles with, but if they do struggle, the, the one thing that, that you have to do well is throw the football. So, for instance... Georgia over their last, let's see, 30, call it eight games, you know, when they've given up less than 400 yards of total offense, they're 34 and 0. And when they give up more than 400 yards of total offense, they are, uh, let's see, what are they? One and three in those games. So, yeah, Ohio State has a chance. Now, do I think that they should be favored? No. Uh, am I going to pick them? Probably not because Georgia is just so good, but they do have the quarterback, the offense, and the wide receiver group to threaten them. That's one of the reasons why Georgia lost to Alabama in the SEC championship game a year ago is that Bryce Young and, and let's see, Mechie and Jamison Williams, like they were able to throw the ball and really hurt the Georgia defense. They were doing it early in the national championship game before Williams got hurt. And, and that's what Ohio State's going to have to do. So that offense is going to have to take uh, uh, front and center for them to create that upset if they want to beat the Georgia Bulldogs. That'll do it for today's program. Uh, Breaking the Huddle, as always, is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. It is the one fans deserve. Enjoy the bowl season and the holiday with the ones that you love. I'm Joel Klatt, and have a great day.